Hello everyone, this is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software team, and one of the founding members of the Dividend Kings Marketplace subscription site on Seeking Alpha. I've had um, several subscribers to both Dividend Kings as well as FastGraphs ask if I would cover Annaly Capital Management. Now, I can understand why people want to know about this stock, so here's a quote courtesy of Seeking Alpha, and this is, you know, showing its stocks up about 2% today. But here are the things that really, I think, attract investors. Number one is the forward yield is 11.93%, and the stock is trading at a P.E. ratio of 8.01. So at first glance, those look like exceptionally exciting attributes or statistics. Now, allow me to dig a little deeper into that by moving on to the fast graph. And so far, all I have here is a plotting of operating earnings. Now, I'm using a blended P.E. ratio here. So we're showing a blended P.E. of 7.69, slightly lower than the forward number. We are showing the dividend yield of 11.9%. The company only has 6% debt to capital, and it's a market cap of $12 billion and a total enterprise value of $125 billion. That's a pretty interesting discrepancy. Now, I'm going to start by, before I get too far along in this presentation, by telling you I don't know a whole lot about M REITs or mortgage REITs. And part of the reason why is because I really have never really wanted to. Because when I look at these companies in a deeper, granular performance perspective, which I'm going to share with you with this video, I find them, first of all, impossible to forecast, very difficult to understand. And I really don't like the performance, even though statistically on a current you know, yield or present value basis, they tend to be very exciting. So let's start by looking at operating earnings here. You can see they're very, very erratic. Now, there is a reason for that. And that reason has to do with dilution, which I'll get to in a moment. But let me build this graph now. Next I want to do is I want to put monthly closing stock prices on the graph. And I do want you to see that there is a correlation here between price and earnings activity over this time frame. This goes back as far as I can with fast graphs to the beginning of 2000. You can see when we had a surge in earnings, we had a surge in price. Price stayed high on this basis. And then we had a, a drop in earnings. And then we had, you know, significant kind of drop in earnings going from the peak here to here. And you saw a significant drop in price. Now, when I put the normal P.E. in here, I think this is important from a present value perspective. I want to emphasize present value perspective that this stock normally trades at about an 8 or 9 P.E. ratio. The blue line here on this graph represents a normal P.E. of 8.7. So we can round that to 9. These are valuation perspectives. When I look at that, you know, it's obvious that that's about where the market has consistently valued this stock. But I want to make a clear point here. You could have bought it here at a 9 P.E. or 8.8 .8 P.E. ratio, which is consistent with this 8.7, you know, normal P.E., but you would have still lost money owning this stock over this time frame, or you'd have made absolutely no money over this time frame. And the value of the stock would have gone from $17 down to eight. It would literally have been cut in half, but I'll get more of that later. Okay, so the point is, just because a stock is attractively valued, has what looks to be a low PE, what's really important is that the earnings, in this case the E, has to be increasing for that to be attractive. Now the next thing I want to add here is I want to add dividends and the dividend payout ratio. This is a very telling part of the graphic as well, in my opinion, because what I want you to notice here, and we're going to look at that in more detail, Detail, the payout ratio tends to be very high. Here it's 124%. Here it's about 94.5%. So obviously when the white line here is above the orange line, it's you know obviously offering a payout ratio higher than its earnings level. But I also want you to notice something else. The reason I said in the written portion of this presentation that I don't consider this suitable for retirement accounts. So let me then add the dividend payout after it's been paid out here. And you can see that this thing from a dividend point of view, it throws off a lot of income, but it doesn't consistently throw off a lot of income. There are numerous dividend cuts that you'll see in this graphic. So I'm going to start with the longest graph I can. And technically, this was a period where it was undervalued, where the blended PE was only 6.34, if you look at the bottom of the pop up there. All right, and if you'd have held that over this 20-year-ish period, which would have been very, very challenging in my view, that $10,000 investment that you might have made on December 31st, 1999, 
would be worth about $9,577, a slight loss, a two-tenths of 1% annualized loss. We'll call that break-even, but if you look at the dividend, cumulative dividend income total, that $10,000 investment would have thrown off $36,500 in dividends, and that compares to an equal investment in the S&P 500 that would have paid about one-tenth of the amount of total dividend income. So you got real high dividend income. You virtually broke even where the market would have doubled your money on just a growth or capital appreciation point of view. And long story short, 10000 would have, you know, given you a $46,000 total rate of return with growth and dividends, annualizing at 8.1% versus about 4.9%. So when you look at it from this long-term perspective, it wouldn't have been all that bad an investment. It certainly threw off a lot of income. But I do want to make a point here. If I start changing this time frame, let's go back and look at the historical graph. If I start cutting off a few years off of this graph, you know, here I'm looking at the graph going back to 2002. And when I look at performance, performance here, I get a really entirely different, not entirely different, but a significantly different perspective. Number one is now, since December of 01, 10,000 would have thrown off 18,000 in dividend income, still substantially more than the market. But now my original $10,000 investment would have depreciated or been cut almost in half. My principal would only be worth $5,237.50. My total rate of return would only be $23,000. That's dividends plus capital depreciation in this example. So I ended up with about a 4.9% annualized rate of return versus a market return of 6.9. But I did get a substantial amount of dividend income. So let's look at some other performance areas here. Oh, actually, before I do that, I want to go back to that because I do want to show you one other thing here that I think is extremely important. A 27% dividend cut in 2003. A 47 and a half followed by a 45 and a half percent dividend cut in 2005 and 2006. Then we ended up with a 7.9 percent dividend cut in 2011, a 16 percent dividend cut in 2012, followed by 26.8 and 20 percent dividend cuts. And there's been no dividend increase over the last four years. So when I look at this historical record, you can see that the dividend income stream, even even though the yield is high, has been very, very inconsistent and very inact now. But the real point is I'm now underperforming the market on a total return basis, but I continue to outperform it on a total dividend income basis. Now, I'm going to drop it down to where we're looking from the period 2006. Once again, I get a significant income advantage. Once again, I get capital depreciation, not as bad during this time frame. I end up with a closer comparison to the S&P, 6% for annually capital management versus 73 for the market. But again, I've underperformed the market here, but I did outperform it in dividend income. If I draw it just since 2011, I want you to notice that you get really, you know, you still get a dividend income advantage. You once again lost about half of your money over this time frame, and you average less than 2% a year total versus 13% in the market. So the point of the story is, I don't consider this really suitable, even though it does throw off a lot of income. You know, it's not predictable income. It's not income that is steady. It's not income that grows every year, which is what I tend to favor. But there's one other point that proponents of these things like to show, and they like to say these things, you know, really outperform during recessions or bad markets. And there's some truth to that. So let me use my scroll bar here and let's take a look at how Annaly would have performed during you know, just prior to the 2001 recession and then just after it. So when I look at performance over this period, what I discover is that I end up with a significant advantage over the market on both dividend income and capital appreciation, and I dramatically outperform the market. And that's really, you know, excellent. However, as I mentioned in the written portion, these bad markets, these recessions don't tend to last very long. So if I extend this out a little bit and carry this 
this out to where we have more of a five to six or seven year period here. Now I look at it, I still outperform on dividend income. My outperformance on capital appreciation is less, but I dramatically outperform the market over this time frame. But let me make one more adjustment here. Let me get past the recession now and let me move into the market where we are past the Great Recession and we're doing a market period here that is a little bit shorter in time in duration. So here I'm looking at the time frame 2003 through 2007, or we're now well past the 2001 recession and we're getting approaching the recession coming up in 2008. But during this five year time frame, if I look at performance, Annaly dramatically underperformed the market on a capital appreciation basis, outperformed it on a dividend income basis, but dramatically underperformed it on a total return basis. So once again, these bull markets tend to last longer than these bear markets. Now let's look at what happened during the Great Recession. So by scrolling back into this time frame, I'm looking at 2007, the beginning of 2007 through 2010. Remember, the recession ended in the middle of 2009. Now that same $10,000 investment over this time frame, beginning in December of 2006 and then ending in, in December of 2010, we would have generated significantly more dividend income than the market and we outperformed the market dramatically. The market actually has a negative growth rate or capital appreciation record during this time frame and annually would have actually made you some profit averaging about six and a half percent annualized here. You add the total up and the annually capital management dramatically outperformed the market. So I will give some credence to the fact that the, you know these mortgage REITs do tend to outperform during the recession. But now if we move away from that recession and then look at what annually has done post the Great Recession, this is a long term, much longer time frame now, what we see is a totally different picture. Now a $10,000 investment made in December of 2010 would have still thrown off almost 7,000 in dividends compared to almost 2,500 for the S&P, but you'd have lost over 50% of your capital and you'd have ended up with a total annualized rate of return of just a meager 1.8% versus 12.4% for the uh, S&P 500. But let me um, point something out. Let me move on now and point something out about these mortgage REITs that I really don't like. In order to do that, I've moved on to Fundgrass, which stands for Fundamental Underlying Numbers. And what I'm looking at here is operating cash flow for Annaly from the period 2006 through 2018. And what I want you to notice is the, the significant periods where we had negative operating cash flow. And that ex partially explains why this company is cutting their dividends so much. They really aren't generating the cash flows to support the dividend. But there's another reason and part for that that I, is the part that I really don't like. And that is dilution. Here I've moved on to common shares outstanding. I'm only going back to 2005. If you've looked at this longer term, you'd see it's even a lot worse than, I, than I'm showing here. But they went from 122 million shares in 2006 to 1.2 billion shares by the end of 2018. By the end of 2019, these are quarterly numbers here now, I've switched to quarterly, we're at 1.456 billion shares, you know, just over the last several quarters. You can see that the growth, you know, of the share count has increased dramatically. Now, if I do this for the all graph, I won't be able to show you the whole graph here because of my, the size of my screen here, but they went from 13 million shares in 1998 to 1.218 million shares. So it's no wonder that these companies, mortgage REITs like Ant, have such a hard time generating any earnings growth, at least on a per share basis, as well as generating any consistency in the dividend income. Now, there's a lot of other measurements I could go through here. If I look at just sales and revenues, this is a price to sales graph here. And what I'm going to do is um, just look at it from a pure standpoint of revenues or sales. And you can see, once again, they're very, very erratic. So one of my biggest problems with looking at mortgage REITs are that they really don't have the consistency that I think people who are looking you know, for retirement money have. Even though they have enticing yields, obviously the dividend records are you know, really bad. And when I look at it you know, from longer term points of view, you can see some very significant dividend cuts. Now there is a salient feature here. 
and I did mention it briefly in the article that I want to show, if you go ahead and reinvest the dividends, and with fast graphs, we simply arbitrarily do it at EOQ stands for end of quarter. Let's go ahead and look at performance over this long-term time frame again by reinvesting the, the dividend income. It makes quite a difference. Now, if we would have reinvested our dividends every quarter, a $10,000 investment in the beginning of 1999 would have thrown off $125,000 cumulative dividend income. And this shows the number of shares that we would have bought with those dividends. So when you got a high yield investment like this, you're actually increasing your share count rather substantially. But th and therefore, you're also increasing the dividends. Even when they're cutting the dividends, you're getting more dividends because here you've got 6,000 shares versus only 12 or 1,300 when you started out. Now, the bottom line is if you're reinvesting all the dividends and you look at growth plus dividends, even though, as I showed you earlier, growth was negative, you dramatically outperformed the market over this time frame. And then if we go to these shorter time frames that I showed you earlier, now we're looking at the period December of 01 through December of 19, you end up with, you know, 10 times roughly as much dividend income as the market. But you end up in almost a dead heat with the market here because now we have a period of time where the market actually outperformed. If you recall this here, you had a loss of your principal on the buy and hold. And so it'd be very, very difficult to buy and hold these stocks over these time frames. But I'll just give you a quick couple of quick glimpses at a couple others. Here we're going to go from 2006 forward. And once again, we end up with almost a dead heat in the market, but we do generate substantially more income. But remember, in this case, we're reinvesting the income. But what we're doing is we're giving up in capital appreciation what we're gaining in dividend income. And I'll do one final calculation for you here. I'll go from the period 2011. Actually, let's draw that back to 2009, let's say post-recession, and you see that you actually underperformed the market for one of the longest bull markets we've been in history. You dramatically outproduced it in dividend income, but your total rate of return, you actually lost a significant amount of money, even though you were buying shares here, and you end up underperforming the market dramatically. So in my viewpoint, I just really don't believe that mortgage REITs belong in dividend retirement portfolios, dividend-oriented retirement portfolios. If you're a long-term investor and you're young and you're looking to hold and you have the tenacity to buy these things and just keep reinvesting the dividends, you obviously can do pretty well over the long run, but it's very unpredictable and who knows what the future might be. Anyway, this is Chuck Carnival of L saying thanks for watching. I hope you got a good perspective here. This will be the first of seven major high-profile mortgage REITs that I'm going to be covering. What I really want you to see is the ins and outs of investing in these things. Don't just look at the current statistics. You need to look at these companies as long-term businesses, and I cover as much of that as I could in the written portion. If you like what you saw here, don't forget to hit our subscribe button and subscribe. And I really appreciate you looking at uh, this video and look forward to offering you six more on additional mortgage rates. Thanks for watching.